Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute webinar. This is Behind the Discoveries. The focus today is on heart valve disease. My name is Matthew Keenan. Normally, I'm behind the microphone at events like the Tour de France. Hence, I've got the cycling jersey behind me. It's an Australian champion's jersey. It's not mine. That belongs to Amanda Spratt. She's one of my daughter's childhood heroes and I've managed to steal that out of her bedroom to stick that into my home office. We are gonna be focusing on heart valve disease and I'll be speaking very shortly with Professor Tom War Marwick. But before we get started, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge our traditional owners and we acknowledge their deep connections to culture and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. Also, by way of housekeeping, your microphones will be muted throughout this webinar and the webinar is being recorded. We'll get you the opportunity to be able to submit your questions via the chat box, but we have had a lot of questions come in already that were sent in when people did register. So we're gonna try and get through those. And if there's some double up from questions that are coming in live, we'll stick with the ones that we've already got in and we'll look for some fresh ones that are coming in through the chat box. If you've got any, Technical difficulties, you can also pop those into the chat box and somebody back of house, not me, will try and get to those to assist you with it. As many of you are probably aware, given the fact that you're actually here listening to this webinar, more than half a million Australians have heart valve disease and many of them don't even know it. These figures are set to rise over the coming years and are a great concern as heart valve disease can cause many other complications, including heart failure, stroke, blood clots, heart rhythm abnormalities, and in the worst case scenario, tragically death. Whilst this is serious, the good news is heart valve disease is increasingly treatable. A lot of it due to the research that is done by the Baker Institute. And today we're taking a closer look at heart valve disease with leading cardiologist and director at the Baker Institute, Professor Tom Marwick. Professor Tom, welcome to your webinar. Hi Matt, thanks for, thanks for uh, moderating this for us, it's great. Well, right off the top of the bat, simple question for those of us who are more accustomed to just riding bikes and talking about it. How does heart valve disease occur? Well, in most cases, heart valve disease is, a, is an aging process. So the, the heart valves are really tiny pieces of tissue that act as doors in the heart to make sure that the blood goes in one direction. And they open and close about 2 billion times in a lifetime. So they're subject to to kind of repetitive strain injury, if you like. So uh, the most common cause is aging. There are some other causes, including infections. You spoke about the common cause being, being aging. What are the common symptoms of heart valve disease? Well, the valve itself doesn't give symptoms, but as you commented in your introduction, it's the consequence of having a valve that isn't functioning normally on the function of the heart. So for example, if the valves are narrowed, not enough blood can get through the heart. So people's cardiac output is compromised. So they may get dizzy or sometimes even black out. They may have exercise intolerance because of that. They can't increase their cardiac output with exercise. And if the valves are leaking, then blood is going in the wrong direction. So for example, the lungs can become congested leading to shortness of breath or on the right side of the heart, fluid can build up in the veins causing swelling in the belly and the legs. You released a white paper recently, it was about 34 pages or so. So I took the shortcut and I just read the media release, which had a few of the highlights. And I touched on it in the introduction about the fact that there's around half a million people each year that have heart valve disease, but perhaps another quarter of a million who, have it, who aren't aware of it. So getting some sort of understanding of the symptoms is a really important step towards treatment. It is, it is. And, uh, you know, as, as we were just discussing, this is... A a disease of aging. And so as people grow older, they attribute exercise intolerance to other things. So, you know, when I talk to folk in the clinic, they will say, you know, I'm not able to do what I could do a couple of years ago, but I'm, you know, I'm 75 now, not 73. Um, and so symptoms, even when they become apparent, are often attributed to something else. And that's the reason why an aspect of this is increasing public awareness to have those kind of symptoms checked out. So beyond the aging element of it, who is at risk of developing heart valve disease? Well, it, it is uh, people who are, say, over the age of 65. They, they would be the prime target. And as people grow older, the risk increases. 
Um, people with known cardiac risk factors are at increased risk, so high blood pressure and diabetes in particular. Um, in Australia, we still do have a problem with rheumatic bowel disease in the Aboriginal community, unfortunately, and, and that whole community is at risk of rheumatic disease. But although we need to get on top of that problem, it is not the dominant cause of heart valve disease in Australia. It's now ageing-related heart valve disease that's become the dominant problem. Looking at some of the some of the risk factors, you've probably touched on some of the things you can do to prevent it. But what are the key elements to preventing heart valve disease? Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, the key element would not to be grow you know not to grow <laughs> older, right? Uh, so yeah, I mean, control of risk factors is important, and care of the cardiovascular system in general. Um, you know, one of the consequences of vascular aging that occurs you know, at accelerated rate due to inactivity or high blood pressure is that the valves are exposed to higher stress. So all of those things are important. But fundamentally, this is, this is not something that there is a magic bullet for. There's neither, there's not a, a treatment that will prevent it nor a medical treatment for it once it's started. So that's the re reason why we're emphasizing people knowing about it and, and being checked for it because it's a fixable problem with various interventions. You've mentioned the wearing out element of it. And this is something that those of us who are a little bit exercise obsessed are always asking the question about, is there the risk of too much exercise and wearing the heart out? Look, there is, there is a risk of that. Uh, it is, it is a, in the big scheme of things from an epidemiologic standpoint, um, you know, in terms of population health, it is a small print issue. So we've got a much bigger problem with inactivity than we have with, with overactivity. Um, but, but you're right, uh, you know, among athletes, there, there are um, cardiac consequences of high level activity. Um, atrial fibrillation is, 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 uh, is an example, an irregular heart rhythm. Um, but generally speaking, when we're talking about heart valve disease, you know, this is related to the passage of years and to some degree to risk factors. Okay, so what are we doing to address the issue, this rising issue of heart valve disease? Well, the reason why we put out this white paper is that we would like to increase awareness. I think that people in the community need to understand that this is an issue as they're growing older. Um, if somebody's not had their heart listened to in a few years when they go and see their GP for a checkup, I think it's an important thing to mention. I think in the old days when people had a single GP that they saw year after year, it was easy to keep track of that. But now, oftentimes, when they go to the practice, they might see a different doctor every time. And so it's impossible for the doctor to know or not know that somebody's listened or hasn't listened, you know, a year ago or two years ago or whatever. And so one very simple thing is for people of the age, over the age of 65, if they haven't had somebody listen to their heart to have, to, to mention it when they next go for a checkup. And then on top of that, you know, there are various policy things that we would like to see happen that would facilitate the recognition of this. And previously in other webinars, we've spoken about how busy and the demands on GPs and our expectations of Absolutely. GPs. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no question. This is not, this is an issue with um, awareness and in, to some degree, you know, people keeping track of their own health. Um, and, and raising the topic, it's, um, I think being a GP is one of the most difficult tasks in medicine. It's, you know, distinguishing uh, the, you know, the, the one patient that you're seeing in a day or in a morning who's got a really serious problem amongst a bunch of things that are rapidly and easily fixed. Um, and so this is not at all to, den to denigrate the GPs. I think the issue is um, creating a system which addresses this problem more effectively than the one that we've got at the moment, really. Yeah, yeah. and rather than denigrating the GPs, I think it's the acknowledgement of how busy they are and the demands yeah, that are on absolutely. their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This goes just back a step slightly, a question that has come in from Mikolidis. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And this is in regards to the numbers. I would love to understand if treated patients are removed from your incident numbers once they're treated. So as we've got an idea of how big that pool of people is. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, so um, those numbers come from epidemiologic studies um, where uh, we have done echoes in the community and um, uh, I identified native heart valve disease. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't include um, 
uh, prosthetic valves. Um, you, it's a fair point. There are there are obviously people in the community with prosthetic valve disease uh, in addition to this. You touched on echoes and there's the ongoing development of artificial intelligence or AI guided mm. echoes and how important your research is to get further down that path. How much of a groundbreaker can they be? Yeah, I think that the, the solution to this problem as with, with many problems uh, is going to involve new technology. Um, for example, the screening process with just with a stethoscope um, can be automated, the heart sounds can be recorded and then interpreted using artificial intelligence. This is something that, that um, is very important because really to listen to the heart well, you need to have a quiet environment. Many clinics are not a quiet environment at all. Um, and uh, so some of that work could be done by the computer. So that's at the first screening level. And then, as you mentioned, we are very interested in um, having, having this AI guided echo. So normally an ultrasound is performed by a very skilled uh, person called a sonographer uh, who, who's, who's highly trained in, in using the machinery. We don't think that that role is gonna go away but a simplified screening ultrasound can be guided by the computer. What it does is to recognize the image that it's seeing and prompt the person that's doing the imaging to change the axis so as to optimize it for various measurements. And um, we're using this in our group in Alice Springs at the moment to try and bring these kind of technologies to people in rural and remote Australia where traditionally we've had problems with getting expertise to the right mm -hmm. location. Well, that diagnosis takes us to a really good question that came in before the webinar got underway from Vicky, which is a pretty simple question, and it's a good one. How early can heart valve disease be detected? Yeah, it is a good question. So um, it can be detected before any symptoms occur. So um, the first thing when the valve either gets narrowed or starts leaking is that the blood flow through it becomes turbulent. And that turbulent flow causes a noise called a murmur. And that's what's heard with the stethoscope on auscultation. So that can be identified at a preclinical stage. It doesn't mean that something needs to be done to the valve at that stage, but it is a marker that that person should go under surveillance to, to track the progress of the valve in case uh, something needs to be done. Uh, and at the moment, that's the aspect of this that is not working really well. Uh, you know, I, I work as a, as a clinician in a couple of uh, hospitals in Melbourne and um, you know, quite often you see an elderly patient come in in a crisis, um, which is the first manifestation of their heart valve disease. And we would like to avoid that, obviously. Yeah, you spoke about tracking the progress of the, the heart, etc. This is a really good question from Ron, a really interesting one on the used by date, so to speak. <clears throat> Ron says that he had heart valve replacement 17 years ago. And the surgeon said in a throwaway manner, you'll be good for another 20 years. So he's had it for 17 years the surgeon said you'll be good for 20 will he possibly need a replacement soon yeah look it's possible that that run would need a replacement um so the way that there are really three groups of of replaced heart valves um one is a mechanical valve um they last for a very long time 20 years or more um uh, their deterioration is a bit unpredictable is the problem. Um, and so obviously because they're mechanical, they do wear out. The second is a tissue valve, which can be put in either through an operation or through uh, across a catheter. Um, and they wear out a little bit earlier than the mechanical valves do, usually in the time frame of about 10 years. And the third is a human tissue valve, um, and they generally are very durable. Um, but all of these are biological systems. Um, and so, you know, that makes an element of this unpredictable. So yes, once the valve is replaced, then it needs to be kept under surveillance because at some stage it may need to be replaced. Many of those replacements are now done over a catheter instead of requiring a reoperation. I'm optimistic about the fact that I got the indication of the three options there, the human valve was the most durable. Yeah, look, the human valve is the most durable. Obviously, it's the it is the least available. Uh, there are particular situations where it's best used. Um, some situations, for example, when the heart valves become infected, uh, would be one situation. Um, there, it's not possible to use them in all of the valve locations. So the aortic valve is the typical one, 
where a human valve is used. So but it, it is an alternative and it's often a good one in younger people, particularly women of childbearing age where you don't want to give a long-term anticoagulant uh, because of concerns about effects on the fetus. Okay, here's a question from Lynn. Lynn says, my husband had an aortic valve replacement and grafted the aorta in 2008 at the age of 64. He was monitored for 10 years prior to this. And when his heart increased by one third in three months, suddenly there was an urgent need for surgery. Why was surgery left so long? Um, look, uh, as always with those kind of scenarios, there's always, there's always lots of detail there and, and other things. I, I guess the first thing is, a reoperation is is never a trivial thing, uh, and so um, that that often is delayed until it's there's absolute certainty that it's needed. The second thing is that with replacing valves, particularly if they're tissue valves, the deterioration of the valve isn't a linear process. It doesn't you know continue and gradually increase over time. It can progress in steps, and hence the the importance of serial follow up. So it's quite possible for somebody with a replacement valve to come this year and have, have a normally functioning valve and come back next year and have a valve that is leaking because something's broken. Um, so that can occur you know, quite acutely. So without knowing the detail, it's, it's, it's hard to know for sure, but, but all of those things can introduce a, a level of unpredictability in this. And again, is that, that highlights the need for regular monitoring? Yeah, I think in, you know, in the people who have a valve replaced, I think generally speaking, the system works pretty well for them. I think everybody understands that you need to listen into the heart and, and, and have an echo done every so often. Usually a cardiologist is involved and so on. So yes, that is absolutely important. But the group that we're most concerned about, the, you know, the, the quarter of a million people with undiagnosed valve disease are not people that have known heart valve replacement. A question from you, and this will be somewhere pretty tight in your wheelhouse, I would imagine. Is there any drug delivery research being conducted in this space? And if so, are nanoparticles being used? And a question from me, what are nanoparticles? <laughs> so it's a, it's a great question. So the first thing is, at, at the moment, we do not have a, a therapy for delaying the progression of heart valve disease. So about 10 years or so ago, there was a hope that because this is an inflammatory and degenerative process that using various antioxidants, statins are a case in point, could be used to delay the process. There were several trials done that were unsuccessful. There are a number of anti-inflammatory drugs that are in development that may be useful, but at the moment we don't have a particular medical intervention for this. Um, so nanoparticles are a means of of uh, putting the drug into a very small particle, you know, sometimes as small as a, a red blood cell, and then delivering it to a particular location in the body. One, one particular aspect of that I'm really interested in is delivering it to the heart muscle uh, in a bubble, and then using ultrasound to explode the bubble so that you land the drug just in the location where you want it. Um, so all of these kind of technologies are under development, but, but at the moment, I don't think that we understand the process sufficiently of the valve being damaged to have created a specific enough target to, to solve this problem. And I think the other thing is that by the time we identify the problem at the moment, it's often late. And so you're dealing with a, a scarring process where it's difficult to come back from. Well, there's a good question on that diagnosis process then from Jenny, which has just come in live via the chat, which is, what is the treatment when first diagnosed? I assume that depends on the level of damage, et cetera, but what are the first steps of treatment? Yeah, so the, 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 the first issue is which valve is involved and, and is it leaking or narrowed? So generally speaking, the, the heart is more able to tolerate leaking valves than it is narrowed valves. So it's able to cope with volume, generally speaking, better than it is with pressure. So oftentimes when a leaking valve is identified, if it's not really severe to begin with, there's a process of tracking it and understanding, you know, where is it on the trajectory of deterioration? Because after all, you see, once it's diagnosed, that's just one point in time. It could have been like that for the last five years, nobody's recognized it. Um, with a narrowed valve, um, if the narrowing is severe, then, then yeah, that's more of an issue. Generally speaking, this is about timing of intervention. And the thing that is, 
is the most important aspect in timing intervention is symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so, so people that are symptomatic, I think, are more likely to go for either a catheter or, or a surgical-based intervention. People who are asymptomatic, yeah, we do sometimes send them for surgery, particularly with leaking valves, because they can damage the heart by exposing it to too much volume, but less commonly than in the case of symptoms. Okay, another question that came in earlier on before the webinar got underway, and this is from Carola. Both my parents developed heart valve stenosis in their old age. Can this condition be hereditary? Yeah, heart valve disease can be hereditary, particularly an entity called bicuspid aortic valve. So the aortic valve is made out of three cusps or three little doors. And in some people, about one or 2% of the population, it's just made out of two. And that isn't a problem through most of, of, of life. Um, in some situations, th those valves can start leaking, usually in the 40s or 50s. And then they tend to start getting narrowed in the, seven, in the 60s and 70s or more. Um, and, and it's those uh, bicuspid aortic valves which can be inherited. There's a belief at the moment that if you have a family history of a bicuspid aortic valve, then you should have an echo to see if you have one yourself and then be tracked. The other reason that's important is that people with bicuspid valves can develop problems of enlargement of the aorta, the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart. And if it enlarges too much, it may rip and, and leak. So it is an important diagnosis to make. Okay, but that, that being said, generally speaking, heart valve disease, most heart valve disease is not inherited. It is that specific entity of bicuspid aortic valve that is. Okay, well, there's some optimism for anybody who does have some family history of that, that you've got you've got some optimism this one from tony is a little bit to what i alluded to earlier on so tony and i might be on the same page with exercise here he asked the question are runners more susceptible to heart valve issues as they age and if you require surgery what would be the preferred option and associated benefits replacement or repair okay so i think the first thing is that i don't think runners are more likely to develop um, significant valve disease by by any material amount. So I, I, I don't think that's an issue. I, if I think about the consequences of too much activity, I'm more concerned about um, you know, damage to the heart muscle in some people that are really very active or atrial fibrillation as we discussed before. So I, I, I wouldn't be primarily concerned about that. In terms of the replacement and re repair question, um, this depends on exactly which valve is involved and what the primary problem is. So if the mitral valve is leaking, that's the valve between the priming chamber, the atrium, and the pumping chamber, the ventricle, on the left side. If that's leaking, then that is quite often repairable, uh, particularly if, if, it's a, um, if it's just one of the leaflets that is bending backwards and sending the blood backwards. In the other heart valves, like the aortic valve, um, uh, that is much more difficult to repair. There are some surgeons that will do uh, an aortic valve repair, particularly for a leaking valve. Generally speaking, narrowed valves are not commonly repaired. They're more usually replaced than repaired. You've just touched on the left and the right side of the heart. We've had a question come in from Rani, which is what does right side heart failure mean? Yeah, so a uh, good and really important question. So. Um, uh, the, the heart is really two parallel pumps, one which pumps venous blood coming back from the body into the lungs, and one that pumps blood out of the lungs and into the body. So the one that pumps the blood out of the lungs into the body is the left side of the heart that operates at a high pressure um, and is the most commonly uh, damaged area in, for example, high blood pressure and, and, and coronary artery disease and so on. Um, the right side of the heart is still very important. Uh, it's often damaged as a consequence of damage on the left side, but sometimes, for example, the heart, the right-sided heart valves may be damaged by other processes, so it can be a problem in its own right. Okay, uh, going back to the question before that we had from Tony and exercise, a similar question from Alison is around diet. What is the influence of diet, not just on developing heart disease, but also repairing existing damage? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I mean, in general, in terms of cardiovascular disease, diet is incredibly important. It is, you know, what we would describe as primordial prevention, what we should be doing in the whole population to decrease the burden of cardiovascular disease. 
Um, but specifically for heart valve disease, um, we don't think that it has a major role. I mean, obviously a heart healthy diet is a good thing for the heart as a whole, um, would help control blood pressure and blood pressure is a potential driver of heart valve disease. But still in terms of, of, you know, of, of its impact on heart valve disease, it's less than it is on heart disease in general. Okay, a question here from Andrew. Andrew gets atrial fibrillation. Can it ever be permanently reversed without medication? Yeah, this is an important question. So atrial fibrillation is really a modern epidemic. Um, we are seeing the rates continuing to increase every year. Um, it is tied very much to um, insufficient physical activity and overweight. Um, now, the reason that Andrew's question is so important is that there's, there's kind of um, a saying that atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. So once you have atrial fibrillation, it is likely to recur. The more it recurs, the more likely it is to come back further. And this is a, a process of what we call remodeling of the atrium. So in the early phases of the disease, if people increase their activity and lose weight, then the likelihood of recurrence can be dramatically reduced. Uh, and in fact, you, you've probably heard of a procedure called um, atrial ablation that is yeah. used for, for treating atrial fib, and that can potentially be avoided or delayed um, by changes in lifestyle. However, uh, there are many people who have had chronic atrial fibrillation for years, and when that occurs, then the atrium enlarges and it's very difficult to get them back to normal rhythm. So it really, in answer to the question, it depends at what stage in the disease you're talking about. Um, but in the early stages of the disease, yes, lifestyle change can really reduce the, the risk. We've had another three questions come in from the chat and I'm skipping straight to Martin because Martin's is for me, pure self-interest. Does swimming using upper body have better heart benefits than cycling, which is basically the lower body? <laughs> well, well, how would you like me to respond to that, Matthew? Um, uh, um, cycling is really good for you <laughs> and everybody should do it. So I, I look, I think the answer is that any exercise is really important. And, you know, some people, for example, who have joint disease in the lower limbs, knees or, or hips, um, find it difficult to walk and, and, and have pain with that. Uh, I, I often ask them if they'd be prepared to swim and, and doing so is a great way of them exercising. But, it, but in terms of the specifics of the question, I don't think there's any particular merit of lower versus upper limb activity. It's just that activity is really important, however you do it. I love the answer, Tom. This one is from Merrill, and Merrill says, with recent awareness of shortness of breath, is it urgent to get attention to this age almost 80? I, I would say it's, I, I wouldn't say it's urgent as in going this afternoon, but I would say it's urgent in terms of getting it addressed in the next you know, week or whatever. It, I suppose it depends on the time frame of what, of what you've experienced. But, but to me, this is, this is probably the most important take home from that white paper you mentioned, Matt. Um, it, it's, it's that people, as they grow older, tend to trivialize their physical symptoms. And with shortness of breath and exercise intolerance, um, that can be the first manifestation of all sorts of nasty problems and they're better recognized and treated. So I think my answer would be, yeah, if you're short of breath or you feel your exercise capacity is less than it was or should be, then yes, you should have it checked over. Yeah, and I'm of the view with zero medical expertise on this, Tom, that you're better off to be overcautious than undercautious when it comes to your health. Oh, I completely agree with that. I, I don't think anybody, any general practitioner or emergency department or cardiologist or whoever would be annoyed at somebody coming with an unexplained symptom. If, it's, if there's nothing to worry about, then they'll say that and it'll be the end of it. If they're not sure, they might send you for an echo test, which is non-invasive and painless, and then you'll know. It won't be a matter of opinion, it'll be a matter of fact. Um, I, I think there's just nothing to be lost from, from having it evaluated. We're in vigorous agreement. This is a question that came in from Sonia. Is mild mitral valve regurgitation anything to worry about when it's done as a stress e echo that doesn't reappear under a normal echo? Yeah. Is that something that's common? Yeah, so this is something that is relatively common. Um, so the mitral valve is the valve between the main 
pump, the left ventricle, and the priming chamber, the left atrium. So this is, you know, exposed to big pressures. And when you're exercising, the pressure goes up and the shape of the heart changes and the valve can start to leak a little bit. Um, if it's not leaking at rest, then I, certainly not a reason to hit any panic buttons. Um, it is worthwhile having it followed up, though, uh, because in the early phases of mitral disease, it is when the heart is stressed that um, things, be things become a problem. So worthwhile having somebody listen to the heart in a year's time or a couple of years' time, listen to a murmur. If there's nothing going on, be reassured. Um, and it can certainly be seen in a, in a stress echo just as a coincidental finding. Here's an interesting question from Vivian, and this is the mechanics of valve replacement, etc. When inserting the valve via a catheter, is the valve temporarily compressed to fit, or is it permanently smaller but still as powerful as a normal valve? Also, is the procedure done under a local or general anaesthetic? Um, so I'll answer the second part first. It can be done either, but, but um, increasingly is done under a, a local anaesthetic. Um, there may be circumstances where a general anaesthetic may be preferable in order to do particular types of monitoring with an ultrasound device in the esophagus, for example. So um, the valve is really uh, deflated uh, onto the catheter. So it's sort of like an umbrella, if you like. Um, so it, it's, it's folded over very carefully. It's supported by a wire scaffolding uh, that is inflated by that, that, that is um, put into the right location. And then a balloon is inflated so as to expand that scaffolding out. And once it's expanded out, then it won't come down again. So um, uh, there are various techniques of dealing with this. So uh, if, the, if the person doing the intervention wants to move it, it is possible to do that before they disengage the catheter from it. Um, so to begin with, the, the, the valve is, is absolutely like an umbrella. Um, does it influence the size of the valve? Yes, there are um, particular scenarios where the catheter approach is not ideal because the valve that needs to go in is a lot bigger than what we have available. But those are very uncommon. And, and so generally speaking, this is a, this is a very good option and ha have now been used for over a decade in high volumes and, a, and are durable and very effective. We've got one more question on atrial fibrillation. This one comes from Heather. What might explain atrial fibrillation that occurs in people of healthy weight and exercise regularly? Yeah, so this is really a problem. Atrial fibrillation is something where there is a hereditary background. Um, so I, I do ask my patients about a family history of AFib um, and it's not uncommon. Um, so atrial fibrillation I guess the most common manifestation is that it's a lifestyle disease um, and, and it is related to inactivity and overweight, but it isn't necessarily so. Um, and, and so it can be inherited, for example, and it can just come on its own. Yeah. It, incidentally, I have it and first experienced it as a 14-year-old and I exercise a lot to the point of driving my wife and children nuts. And this is part of the reason why I'm an ambassador for the Baker Institute. And I've had two uncles and a grandfather who passed away due to a heart attack. So I'm in this purely out of self-interest, Tom. We've got another question that's come in from Kathy, and she has a heart murmur that exercises. She's got good blood pressure. However, at the age of 70, she does get tired. Can heart valve be caused by the heart, heart murmur? Are the two related? Yes, indeed. Yeah, the heart murmur is the manifestation of the heart valve problem. So okay. as I was saying before, when blood flows over a normal valve, it's just kind of like a river flowing. It's sort of lam what we call laminar flow. Um, but when the valve becomes abnormal, either leaking or narrowed, then it becomes turbulent. It's sort of like the rapids. Um, and that process of the of it's just like a waterfall. You can hear a waterfall. It's the same as turbulent blood flowing through a a, a disease valve. So the murmur is caused by whatever heart valve lesion you have. And there's aspects of the murmur that can be used for judging the severity of the problem. Um, but it's something that is best evaluated further by an echocardiogram if you haven't had one already. And particularly if you're developing symptoms, then that's something worth following up on. Yeah, get it checked out. We've got two more questions. This one is from Anne. What would be your prevention advice regarding someone in their late 60s with a paternal family history of heart attacks and early mortality 
who is reasonably fit and healthy, but has a cardio calcium reading of 130. And what is a cardio calcium reading? Right. So um, a, a, a coronary calcium score is, is a score um, that comes from a CT scanner uh, that identifies the amount of calcification in the coronary arteries. So when the arteries become damaged by fat deposits in them, uh, before they even start narrowing, um, calcium is laid down with those fat deposits. And so that's a marker of coronary disease. So if you've got coronary calcium, it means that you have some coronary disease. It may not be something that you need to have an intervention for, but it means that the process of narrowing the arteries has begun. So I think that somebody who's got a coronary calcium score of over 100, um, generally speaking, there are obviously particular scenarios where this is more or less attractive, but generally speaking, should be on a step to try and get the cholesterol level down mm -hmm. and certainly needs to have an evaluation of of cardiovascular risk, but a coronary calcium score, coronary calcium scores do go up with aging. Um, but generally speaking, over a hundred means that there is a level of risk that is worthwhile taking some some uh, preventive treatment for. So statin would be the top of my list, and then I would evaluate other potential drivers of coronary risk. But it's something that should be evaluated because it can be a flag to mischief developing. Okay, we've got one more question from Lisa and then a question from me. This one's a long one, Tom. So Lisa has the question, my partner has a complex congenital heart disease and received a human donor pulmonary valve in 2001 at the age of 22. At the time, we understood the valve would last 15 years. But now over two decades later, it shows no signs of wear or mechanical insufficiency. How has our understanding of valve replacement surgery changed over the past 20 years? What does the clinical data tell us about prognosis and how might evolving best practices be applied in cases such as my partners in the current day? Yeah, that's a, that's a sp very specific question. So th this really goes back to our conversation before about the human valves being the most durable. Um, so this valve is being put in the pulmonary position, which is the right side of the heart. So that's the low pressure side of the heart. And that's the side that is most friendly to, to having valve replacements, at least in the pulmonary artery put in. So the fact that it's lasted 20 years um, is fantastic. Um, I think not all that unusual. Should it have deteriorated by now? Not necessarily. Um, so this is a biological process. It depends on how, um, on how the valve sits into the heart and various other things that are very hard to measure and predict. Um, in terms of our understanding of this, um, we don't, I think, understand adequately at the moment the drivers of, of these valves, why some of them deteriorate and some don't. I think it is probably related to vortices, in other words, the turbulence of blood flow across the valve. Um, I think that that process accelerates the aging of them. And in your partner's particular situation, I, I think the answer is just continued surveillance of the valve. Um, but yeah, I, obviously that's a, a very, a really excellent situation to be in and, um, and just needs caution going forwards. I don't think it's possible to say, you know, that the valve's not deteriorated at 20 years, so it'll deteriorate at 25 years. It, it may last for 30 years, um, but it's a matter of keeping it under surveillance. I'm going to sneak in one more question. This one comes from Andrea before I close out with one question from myself. And this is about the way the surgery is conducted, open heart surgery versus transcatheter. How is surgery conducted now in these situations and how much progress have we made in the last 20 years? Uh, the pro progress has been just phenomenal. Um, and, and, and in a way, this was the other rationale behind our white paper to, to make people aware of this because... Um, if I think back to the period that I graduated and was training, the, 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 the issue of timing of surgery was very difficult because, you know, as we've discussed, this is a disease of older people. You don't want to send an 80 year old to have their chest opened and have the recovery from that, you know, which for an 80 year old could take, you know, three or six months um, if you could possibly avoid it. And for that reason, there was a lot of hesitation of going forward and so on. Um, the ability to replace these valves over a catheter has completely transformed that. Uh, and so 
Uh, and I think that's actually part of the mindset that we struggle with a little bit here, which is that um, the, the issue is not picked up early enough um, and intervened on early enough because of kind of a hangover from, you know, that, that those previous considerations about avoiding or delaying surgery. So yes, I think that the catheter-based valves have been transformative. Um, it's not possible to use them in every case. Uh, for example, if there is a coronary problem or an aortic problem that needs to be dealt with at the same time, um, if it's a mitral valve, then the catheter valves are much less advanced than they are in the aortic position. There are lots of other considerations, but, but just the awareness that this can be done using a non-invasive or minimally invasive approach is something that you know, people should be aware of and, and also recognize that um, they, they don't have to undergo a major operation in order to maintain a good quality of life and, and no symptoms going forward. So on that topic, the closing question from me, we've touched on the progress that has been made over the last 20 years. What's the key work that you're doing now in this space? And where do you hope that we are as a community in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time? Yeah, our focus has been on the process of detection because we think that that's where the bottleneck is between unrecognized heart valve disease and acute presentations to hospitals. So we want to try and solve that problem. Um, we think that part of the solution here is to put the diagnostic technique, the most important diagnostic technique, which is ultrasound or echocardiography. We think that the solution to that is putting it into the hands of general practitioners or practice nurses. And that's the reason why we're putting a lot of effort into this artificial intelligence strategy. So we have developed a automated system for doing the measurements offline. Um, and we're now rolling out this AI system so that the practice nurse can take the pictures. And so we want to make this process of somebody having a valve problem detected much easier than it is now. And in in five or 10 years time, yeah, I would like to see that as part of, I, I would like to see a healthy 65 year old checkup, essentially, because there are a triad of three diseases of old age that are continuing to grow and we're not on top of. Atrial fibrillation, heart failure, and aortic stenosis. All of them, echocardiography is central for. And so, you know, our efforts are trying to make that easier in order to make the diagnosis and assess the severity and fix the problem. And you're doing a wonderful job in the process. And thanks for your time today, Professor Tom Marwick from the Baker Institute. We've already getting some positive feedback on your contribution to this discussion today. It has been informative without being alarmist. It's pretty simple first step in terms of getting that checkup is really important. We're also keen to hear the feedback from all of you as well. Please provide some feedback. There'll be a short survey that will be sent out via email today on what you thought of this webinar, what you'd like to hear about in the future and any tips on how we can improve it. Professor Tom, thanks for letting me host the session today. I've really enjoyed it. I always learn something and I look forward to actually seeing you in real life at a Baker Institute function <laughs> sometime in the not too distant future. Let's all hope for that. Good to see you. Thanks everybody. All the best. Bye for now.